Welcome back, everyone. This week, I'm going to discuss why I like Green Thumb Industries and why I like Green Thumb Industries over the other Tier 1 MSO peers. If you're interested in reading this or clicking on any of the links, in the description of this video, you will find the link over to this publication and then you can browse and look at it yourself or just pause the video a lot to look at pictures. You do you. But I invite you over. You're more than welcome. I, sh I should note that I bought Green Thumb when it was trading at 10 times cash flow and as of the publication of this piece, it's currently trading at 14 times cash flow. Fundamentally, I'm a play it safe pessimist who invests in wildly volatile industries. Talk about an oxymoron. As such, that shapes how I invest. This is worthwhile to remember when looking at how I go about my analysis. A picture is worth a thousand words, so let me show you some things I'm considering, and there's going to be a lot of pictures in this. First one, you have long-term debt to equity. You'll see that Green Thumb is at the bottom with 32.1%, Verano second, True Leaf is third with 52%, and then Cure Leaf's at 82, and then you have Cresco way up there at 150%. As far as I'm concerned, the above chart suggests to me that they have a better capital structure that is better equipped to handle economic downturns, interest rate fluctuations, or other adverse events that may impact its ability to meet debt obligations. It means that they have a greater financial flexibility which allows them to pursue growth opportunities, better invest in R&D, research and development, pay dividends or repurchase shares, and they're doing some of those things as of recent. As a consequence of having a lower debt to equity ratio, they're also able to enjoy more favorable borrowing terms due to a lessened perception by lenders of defaulting. And with the usury rates being cast upon much of this industry, that might come to matter. On to cash from operations. Green Thumb, yet again, comes out ahead in regards to this too. Here you will see at the top of the chart, Green Thumb at $224 million of cash from operations. And then at the bottom, you'll have Cresco sitting at $65 million, Cure Leaf at $85 million, Verano at $106 million, and True Leaf at $141 million. Let's move on. Net income. Green Thumb's the only one with any. And it's not much, but it's still better than the rest. Yet again, you'll see Cresco at the bottom, Green Thumb at the top, and then the Cure Leaf, True Leafs, and Veranos in between, but they're all negative except for Green Thumb. I like companies that have positive working capital. Maybe that's just me. Liquidity concerns are concerning to me. So you'll see True Leaf is actually at the top here with 234 million of working capital, then Green Thumb, then Cresco, then Verano, and interestingly enough, Cure Leaf is the only one with negative working capital. So that doesn't mean that they're necessarily illiquid, but it also doesn't mean that they're not. And actually, let's go back into this. Since pretty much the last two, four, four quarters, five quarters, it's been falling for them. But of course, you could say that most of them are flat or falling as well. So return on capital is a worthwhile metric to take into consideration. Green Thumb is second in place. Quite honestly, they're all kind of within this tight-knit spot of one another. So even though Verano's at the top at 6.4% of return on capital, Green Thumb's at 5.42, Cure Leaf's at the bottom at 1.62%. But they're all positive, so that's, that's good. Yet again, this isn't why is 
Cresco, Cure Leaf, Verano, True Leaf, Bad, and Green Thumb, Good, right? Maybe if you paid attention to the denotation of words and not the connotation of words, you would have caught that, but that's okay. Green Thumb is the only one with a positive return on equity, but of course you need to have net income in the first place. So it would only make sense that the only company with net income has a positive return on equity, being that positive net income is re required to have that. So it only makes sense. Cresco is, whew, like negative 93%. Cure leaves at negative 22%. You know, that's why a lot of people, uh, they don't like to, sp they don't like to speak on things in which the thing warrants uh, positive outcomes based upon its merit, but instead they relatively compare and contrast. So in this instance, you could say, well, cure leaf is negative, but Cresco's much worse. It's like, Okay, good. So you're, what you're also saying is that you're less worse. That, that's how people frame things. Just like you could say in absolute terms, all of these companies have pretty pathetic and dire metrics relative to other industries and other sectors. But of course, then you would say, yes, but they also have certain headwinds that those other sectors don't have, which is why it's important to not view things in isolation and compare them both in absolute terms as well as relative terms and to not remove things too much from context, but also at the same time, not being so narrowly focused to ignore the rest of the opportunity set of investing. But I digress. Return on assets. Verano's at the top of the pack. Then you have Green Thumb. They're both sitting at roughly 5% then Cresco, then True Leaf, and then Cure Leaf, but they're all positive, so that's good. Speaking of assets, you don't want your growers sitting on a bunch of products that can spoil. They all seem to be fairly in line with one another on this note. So what we have here is asset turnover. And they're all pretty much sitting at 0.4 times, and Cresco is sitting at 0.5 times, but this is actually nice to see some convergence with them all, or not nice, depending on your perceptions, I suppose. I don't know how much of an issue the following is, but I'm concerned with cannabis companies keeping depreciated inventory on their books to avoid write downs. With many companies being better calibrated in regards to their production and Sales, I suspect it's less of an issue than it used to be. With that said, I do feel more comfortable with a lower inventory level as it means the risk to the downside of a write down is less. Of course, on the other hand, you want enough inventory to stay stocked up, but none of this should matter to you if you're an adjusted EBITDA evangelist since depreciation isn't recognized in your belief system. So here you have inventory levels, Cresco Labs, the one with the higher turnover rate, as you saw in the last image, also has the lowest inventory. Is that correlation, causation? I don't know. But then you have Green Thumb with the second lowest at 118 million. And then Verano is 150 million. Now you might say there's not much difference between 118 million and 150 million. But that's because you're not thinking in percentage terms. To go from 120 million of inventory to 150 million of inventory is to increase your inventory levels by 25%. So that's worthwhile. Then you'll see Cureleaf, for instance, their inventory levels are wildly fluctuating. And then you'll also see True Leaf's inventory levels kind of are the same. And then you'll also note that Verano's inventory levels back in, call it, 2021 shot up. Now, 
things have settled out from where they were a few years ago. So just all things to look at, pay attention to. You can kind of see Cresco and Green Thumb have slow and steady up and to the right, while other ones are volatile as could be. Price to tangible book, book value is important to me. You don't just get to pile on debt and make a bunch of non-accretive and overpriced M&A deals to throw it into the goodwill and marked up PP and E pile while simultaneously growing more than you can sell and then tell me you're trading at or below book value to spin a pretty story of being undervalued. Nope, not on my watch. Book value is a funny thing that's beyond the scope of this article too. So with that said, three out of the five names I'm discussing today have negative price to tangible book value, meaning that their total liabilities and intangible assets outweigh their tangible assets. And only one of these two companies that don't have negative price to tangible book value is even remotely reasonable at 5.6 times, while Trueleaf is at 57.2 times, and like I said, the other ones are negative, so they don't even show up on the chart. Now, there's a lot to be said about book value and, and market value and tangible book value, but as I noted, trying to run through these quick enough and not make this a whole lecture course, so you'll have to forgive me. I'll publish something on that at some point, I suspect. Ah, oh, here we go. Deferred tax liabilities. Just hearing those three words reminds me of another classic game that cannabis companies like to play in regards to not wanting to face the music and pay the piper. So look at these <laughs> big numbers, big numbers, people, right? Tax liabilities beyond many of their cash positions, beyond their inventory positions, beyond current assets. It's, it's interesting to juxtapose how much taxes they owe relative to assets they have. So you have Cresco Lab sitting at 45 million, Green Thumb at 62 million, Verano at 183 million. That's quite the stair step function. I can't remember if I... Verano's at 183 million. That's why I meant to say if I didn't. So that is now 200% more than Green Thumb. Okay, then we have Cureleaf. They're at 311 million. That's, that's interesting. Total revenue compound annual growth rate. This might be last, but it's not the least. I'll let you interpret this chart however you'd like. That is an interesting chart. And like I said, I'll leave you to interpret that however you'd like. But it is worthwhile to know, and I'm going to discuss this in a moment, how on Green Thumb's investor presentation talks about how they expect the industry to grow at 12% compound annual CAGR, 12% CAGR, and, and you could say that they've done that. It's just been very lumpy. It hasn't been a smooth, you know, out, like many of the companies in the S&P 500 grow roughly in line with GDP. They're, they're closet GT, GDP growers, if you will. And, and that, that's a lot of companies. So companies in an industry, whether that be energy drinks or in this case, I don't want to say the word. I don't think I've said it yet. Don't want to get this video flagged. I don't. I haven't said the word yet. We only, you know. But uh, in this particular industry, normally they should be growing roughly in line with that. And like I said, it's been lumpy. So it is interesting to note, though, that Verano is at 5.5%. Green Thumb's at 5.5%. And then it just gets worse from there. And then... You could say, but the industry growth rate's 12%, so what's going on? Are those projections too high? Blah, blah, blah. Like I said, make of it what you will. Look at this chart because you could say, well, when you grow, in, in one year's time, when you grow 100% or 200%, you can have a lot of zero growth years after that and be okay. But the problem with that is, is well, as we all know, 
that got priced in in perpetuity and now the stocks are much lower than they were back then and many of problems come from all of that and that's beyond the scope of this article. I'm not even going to go down the sales leaseback rabbit hole link in the article. Yet again, you can find this article in the description of the video and go read it, go look at the stuff, go click on the links, or don't do any of it. I'm not even going to go down the sale leaseback rabbit hole in which a bunch of strapped for cash companies did this. And why wouldn't they? After all, operating lease liabilities are amortized over the term of the lease. And since the adjusted EBITDA maximalists don't believe amortization matters, then why wouldn't companies window dress? But that's beyond the scope of this article. To finish this section, Let's add a score rank tallying and totaling all the separate categories for funsies. Just like any metric, an overall score shouldn't matter much to you. It doesn't mean much to me. Lowest score wins. Like I said, this is all kind of stupid. For instance, should inventory have the same weighting as net income? No, it probably shouldn't. Also, I'm not counting the price of tangible book value in this, but let's do this anyway because I'm kind of curious. And with that result, what you find is that Grain Thumb is at 18, Verano's at 21, True Leaf is at 35, Cresco's at 37, and Cure Leaf is at 45. Uh, honestly, I kind of thought that the spread between Verano and True Leaf would be less, and I actually thought that the spread between True Leaf and Cresco would be more. And I thought that the spread between Cure Leaf and Cresco would be more. So, interesting. And I also didn't think that Verano would be this close to Green Thumb. So, whatever any of that means. So there you have it. I've put forth my case on a relative basis as to why I prefer Green Thumb over the other Tier 1 MSOs. This just means that on a relative basis that Green Thumb is the quote-unquote best which presupposes the question as to whether a person should even be invested in this sector to begin with. If this industry turns around due to catalysts being unlocked, then in all reality, you'd probably want a more leveraged player, or at least a, a, take a basketed approach and include one of those like I've done. But, but this industry has been full of broken dreams. Like I started this off with, I may play it safe pessimist. Uh, actually, I don't think I read the very initial introduction of this in which I talked about how uh, I plan on addressing why I think Green Thumb is better than the other Tier 1 MSOs. I don't think I mentioned that I bought Green Thumb for 10 times price to cash flow, and now it's at 14 times price to cash flow. And I think that introduction also mentioned that I wanted your opinion and your thoughts on this topic, predominantly what am I missing about specific idiosyncratic green thumb things as to what what dirt do you have on them? Not just necessarily why Cure Leaf or whatever is better than green thumb, but specifically what am I missing? Now we're going to go get into the, uh, the bear case, if you will, for this, but it's pretty lame. Uh, just some interesting tidbits actually, but so uh, now I lost my spot. Uh, oh yes. Oh yes. That's what prompted this. Like I started this article off with, I'm a play it safe pessimist. I think I might have read that or might not have read that, but I'm a play, play it safe pessimist in this very volatile space. So it's kind of an oxymoron. And then Understanding that, though, would might, might help you understand how I'm thinking about all this, which would explain the ratios I've used. Anyway, let's move on. Then there's other catalysts to consider, such as Florida. It's not a coincidence that the, name, the names in the below chart are ordered the way they are in percentage returns. You'll note that I place consortium in this chart, which we'll get into why in a moment. So here you have... Uh, year to date, excluding Friday, this, I, I don't know what the dates are, Friday, let's just say, this chart's a couple of days old is what I'm getting at. Uh, but what you see is True Leaf, year to date, in these top six 
because I'm just going to call Ken Sortium. In these top six players, the ones we've been discussing, plus Ken Sortium, True Leaf is up 57%. Might, might you think that's because of what's going on with the whole Florida situation? And then you have Ken Sortium up 56%. And then you have Cresco up 47%. And then you have Verano up 29 Then you have Cure Leaf. This is actually, I think, the only time Cure Leaf uh, has beaten Green Thumb. Cure Leaf's up 21%, and then Green Thumb's up 18%. Okay, why did I add Consortium? These best performers are major Florida, oh, I almost said the word, players, as the below chart shows. Link in the article if you want to go to the site and here you see it the top 15 medical companies in florida truly oh boy i'm not going to read all this there's too many too many of these words i'm not allowed to say uh true leaf is number one by by a good deal then you have verano then you have cure leaf then you have Fluent at number six, which is Consortium, and that's why I included Consortium because they're the sixth largest players. And then way, way down, way down, which is ironic because it's called Rise. Ha <laughs> ha, ironic juxtaposition there. Rise is number 15th, which might explain the performance year to date of some of these names. You'll note that Green Thumb is way down there at the bottom of the list. The safest bet and the best bet require you to define what those words mean. What I'm putting forth is that it's reasonable is that it's a reasonable bet. Embedded in that statement are certain presuppositions about the industry, which is beyond the scope of this article. I'm assuming that you have some cursory knowledge and understanding of matters. I'm trying to keep things short. And this is short for me. I believe that the overhang for these stocks, in large part, is the consequence of multiple compression. Sure, they've diluted shareholders and have taken on debt, but it's my belief that the prices have fallen so much because they should have never been that elevated to begin with. To paraphrase Buffett, maybe the stock market has been correcting a previously incorrect forecast. Simply put, the stocks have undergone multiple compression. The multiples have come down while the earnings have gone up. I believe 2023 was the year of things finally leveling to a good base, leveling to a good base, at least for the interim. Finally an entry point after five years of idiocy. The problem is that there's still ample idiocy out there. But I digress. I consider Green Thumb a CPG. Thankfully, they also note that that's what they are. We are a family of CPG brands. This allows me to pull up a chart like this, link in the article, and see if they trade in line with historical norms. A good starting point for investing. And Hilliers, here you will see S&P 500 EV to EBITDA multiple in the United States from 2014 to 2022. That's, I call it a decade, but uh, not quite, but roughly a decade. I consider this industry to be a consumer staple. After all, people want their intoxicants. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's, it's a medicine for some. And then this below image, uh, should convince you that if this doesn't convince you of them being a staple in consumers' lives, I don't know what will. Depending on your degree of confirmation bias and intellectual honesty, you can either create a chart of the top MSOs on a LTM last 12 months or NTM next 12 month basis. The NTM makes them look cheaper. And here you see on an EV to EBITDA basis next 12 months that they're all trading between 6.7 times and 13.8 times. EV to EBITDA. The only one that radically changes if you do it on a last 12 month basis is Cure Relief, in which all of them but Cure Relief trade in that EV to EBITDA range of 8 to 11.2, and the Cure Relief is 24.2 on a last 12 month basis. 
But we all tell ourselves that we're investing for the future, so let's stick with that. According to the earlier image of the S&P 500 EV to EBITDA, consumer staples over the last decade have roughly ranged from 12 times to 17 times EV to EBITDA. Of course, I suspect that was on a trailing 12-month basis, which means that all of these names, with exception to Curaleaf, are within that range on a last 12-month basis. Yet again, this is merely a piece of the puzzle, but if you're looking for some good post hoc rationalization, you can confirm your bias with merely this one chart. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if we go back up here, consumer staples trade between 12 to 17 times EV to EBITDA. And then if we look on a, at the chart, they're all trading within that range. Now, the problem with this is, is I suspect that many of these consumer product goods and consumer staples don't have the same headwinds as this industry has. So you might want a discount for that, let's say. So then you could say, what's a reasonable discount? Well, that's up to you. As well as, I don't know how true this is, but I would say that most of those S&P 500 companies that are consumer staples actually make profit. I know, it's a crazy thing, but you might want to factor that in. All right. I already know what you're saying. Who's this crazy man using such witchcraft metrics as return on dot, dot, dot? Doesn't he know that he's supposed to use revenue and adjusted EBITDA to gauge a business? Screw adjusted EBITDA, for real. Gaslight yourself if you want to, but don't drag me into your nonsense. I'll have a whole article on that topic itself at some point. Also, I plan on writing an article around Organigram at some point. Don't hold me to it. I will have to try my darndest at justifying that, so I'll probably have to use adjusted EBITDA. But I assure you, there will be a disclaimer if I do. Okay, here's the bad, which is pretty weak. So I'm asking you to tell me what is bad about them. Yet again, don't, not in this, I mean, if you want to, but not in some relative contrasting sense. Like, let's just say, for instance, if you asked me to say something bad about Cureleaf, me saying Green Thumb has positive net income and Cureleaf doesn't, therefore Cureleaf is bad, isn't the greatest of arguments. That's that's a arguing via relative contrast and talking about the good of one and the bad of other. You'll notice most political campaigns take that form. I'm saying, it, for instance, you could say that, well, and this is actually true and I did not include it in here, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, Green Thumbs, uh, if I'm getting this correct, their gross margins as well as their operating margins are both uh, shrinking. Now, maybe not a lot, but it's something to look into. And you can maybe say something like their cash flow from operations is positive, but their free cash flow is not. Or they went from free cash flow positive to negative free cash flow positive. It was like, maybe that's the start of a trend. Maybe it's a, a, a simple fluctuation of accounting. But that's what I'm talking about, okay? Those kinds of things. So, on to the bad. Unfortunately, I don't have much to say on this front. I don't like that, so please tell me bad things about Green Thumb. My automatic, and, and you know, if you want to be an idiot about it, it's like, well, he told me to say some slanderous, dumb things, like, no one's telling you to be an idiot. Actually, that's kind of not true, but I'm not going to try to encourage, condone, or facilitate blatant moronic idiocy. So don't just say dumb stuff. Say thoughtful, intelligent things, please. Uh, my automatic, default, baseline presupposition in regards to practically everything is that I'm chronically and always missing something, and thus could be wrong and in danger of being ignorant as such. Maybe I'm in too deep and have tainted my vision with rose-colored glasses. I don't know. So please, 
Share any unflattering information in regards to Green Thumb in the comment section. By their own admission, they believe that the cannabis industry, and we've already touched upon this, the cannabis, ah, oh, dang it, I said the word, ah, oh, man, ah, 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 I got me. Uh, the industry is expected to grow at 12% a year. But as I chronically insist, you have to question the concepts in a statement as much as the statement itself. What do they mean by growth? A 12% growth of what? Right? Uh, the growth of dispensaries, the, the growth of production, the growth of consumers, the growth of revenue, the growth of net income, on and on. It, huh, you know, some of these thought 12% growth is like, yeah, shares outstanding and debt. Right? We're supposed to grow shares outstanding in debt at 12%, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Someone make that into a meme. Uh, the problem with these sorts of statements is that it doesn't necessarily translate to profits. And, I don't know, speciously and ostensibly, you could say that a share trades as a function of a multiple of a earnings per share, and, and, then, and then earnings per share is well, what does earnings mean? And then you come to realize that means net income. And you're like, oh boy, we're in danger there. So now we're going to have to value this on, well, most recently, uh, uh, we're not even supposed to do a price to earnings. I, I saw this nonsensical garbage just today. Uh, a price to innovation. Ah, beautiful. Price to innovation. So what, I, I think Organigram has what, like 120 some odd SKUs, stock keeping units. So the more they innovate, the, the higher their stock should go, I guess. Anyway, the only thing I see on the above image that grew by 12% or more is SG&A, referencing their nine months ending year over year. You'd think that at least their revenue would be in line with the alleged industry growth rate. However, revenues grew 2.34%. I don't care about whatever cope and fallacy the cannabis proselytizers have in defending this. What I care about is that net income per share damn near fell in half. And maybe you should care about that too. I also do care about what the proselytizers have to say. I just said that to create emphasis. Now, you might say, come on, dude. They're only one of a few cannabis, uh, said the word again, a few companies who ever, who even have net income. And I'd say, fair enough. And that's why I'm talking about them in the first place, and I'm giving them a chance. Then you have this. Trigger warning, people. Trigger warning. Then you have this. Actually, you shouldn't be triggered because you should actually be like, hmm, he makes an interesting point. Unless you want to excuse their behavior because they're part of your tribe and you're an ideologue, uh, then you'll incorporate whatever cope and fallacy necessary to justify any behavior uh, well, in your tribal allegiance, so you do you. Then you have this. Now, you could call this a low blow, and it might be, but I found it, so I'm sharing it with you. Inclusion and belonging. Design an inclusive culture that addresses the inequities of traditional industries through equitable hiring, promotion, and compensation strategies for all. First of all, like this, this BS differentiation of we're a new industry, which they are, uh, versus traditional industries that are, like the implication is that traditional industries are inequitable, which is interesting because like Boeing, like a lot of these companies, S&P companies have this, you know, ESG mandate. And so many traditional industries uh, are addressing equity. So this is like some pseudo virtue signaling juxtaposition, con compare and contrast. The problem is it's predicated on a false premise. You know, anyway, ah, inclusion and belonging. So, huh, this is funny. This is funny. I guess that's why they provided these photos in black and white to make it more difficult to see their blatant contradiction. You see this? Now, let's play Waldo with the white folks. And then maybe we can do some math and divide the white folks by the other ones that we're trying to make more equitable.
people. Like, I, I, I kind of lost for words. Let's keep talking about equity, shall we? Optimal share structure. It's always funny to see people pseudo virtue signaling about equity until it comes to the actual shareholder equity. And then you find out it's not too equitable after all. And you'll find link in the article. I believe it links you to a 10K of theirs annual report. And they have this to say. Now, keep this in mind when you see this picture. Super voting shares, 22,000 roughly. Multiple voting shares, 3,000. And then subordinate voting shares, 210,000. Okay, so between super voting shares and multiple voting shares, we'll just call that 26,000 versus the 210,000 of subordinate voting shares. But here's the kicker. Our voting control is concentrated. This is, I believe, under the risk section. Subordinate voting shares are entitled to one vote per share. Multiple voting shares are entitled to 100 votes per share. And super voting shares are entitled to 1,000 votes per share. As a result, these three names, Kovler, Grossman, and I'm not even going to try to put Giorgio this, I don't know. These, pe these three people potentially have the ability to control the outcome of matters submitted to our shareholders for approval, including the election and the removal of directors and any arrangement or sale of, of all or substantially all of our assets. I do not know how to get out of this image that I have clicked on. I am stuck, people. I am stuck. Well, anyway, we're pretty much at the end of the video. So I'll just leave it here. They would have to dilute shareholders by, uh, I, I think it's 109 times over in order for equity to be established. So, I guess if you truly want equity, then you can dilute the shareholders a bunch of times over or somehow, I don't know, boycott or I, I don't know, whatever. But these are kind of lame arguments and not really reasons to uh, invest or not invest. And much of it's just smoke and mirrors and fugazi and just nonsense and posturing and this stuff. So with that, uh, pretty lame, that's a pretty lame uh, bear thesis. So please help me, description, tell me what I'm missing. Tell me, you know, uh, tell me something like how this company was born out of a uranium shell company when it first got listed. You know, that'd be a good piece of information. Maybe I didn't know that. And, and then you can speculate with some sort of conspiracy theory about all that. Or whatever you have to offer, or tell me good things that I missed. That'd be cool too. Oh wow, you 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 didn't consider this, or you know you noted this, but you know not within this. Con whatever. I put this information out to help you, and then maybe you can help me, and then we can have a community and live life and make money. Isn't that why we're here? So with that, I am done. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to go over to my substack subscribe read the article look at the pictures and think notice i didn't tell you to buy anything i didn't tell you not to buy anything i'm not legally obligated to do that probably should give a disclaimer and i'm here to stimulate thought okay so even if i said something stupid that was completely wrong maybe i had to think about that maybe i'd go look something up and research something i don't know how many times one of Talking to stupid people, and maybe I'm a stupid person, you shouldn't discount that, that talking to stupid people, they'll say things so dumb, so crazy, so outlandish and far-fetched that they completely catch you off guard and you don't have an adequate rebuttal. So 
then you have to go think about it. Like, well, that's wrong, but how is that wrong? And, and then you, you really have to think about things and then you then integrate more information into your being and become a more articulate creature and a more comprehensive individual. So maybe I'm the stupid person who's suffering from Dunning-Kruger issues and I'm making, I'm saying things so crazy and outlandish that you're like, wow, he is, he is right for all the wrong reasons. So there you have it. Anyway, thank you for watching and until next time.